So today is the second episode of my series about a spark gap Tesla coil and how to build it. And this episode is about this high voltage transformer. The voltage of the transformer has to be enough for the spark gap to operate, basically to make an arc in it. But it also doesn't make any sense to use a too high voltage because such transformers are harder to get and the voltage is harder to handle. So I would recommend something like Tu to 15 kV, even though Tu kV is still quite low and the spark gap may not work properly at this voltage. You have to use a very small distance in it and it's going to get unstable and you can use it in a worst case for a very small Tesla coil but I think a more reasonable range is about from 4 to 12 kV. This is roughly the size of secondary I plan to use and I think about 6 or 8 kV should be fine. And for this size of secondary you probably need something like 500 to 1000 watts of power. And of course the required power doesn't go up with the size of it linearly. If you for example double the size of this, you probably need about 4 times to 8 times more power. The power depends more like on the second or even third power of the size of it. And if you halve the size of it, you can use about 4 times to 8 times less power. But of course transformers are usually rated in volt amps because the power factor doesn't have to be one always. And if you for example have a 1000 volt amp transformer which supplies 10 kilovolts, which is 10,000 volts, then the output current is going to be 0 0.1 amps or 100 milliamps. So that's the voltage and the power of the transformer, but on top of it the transformer has to be current limited. It has to be short circuit proof, basically, as I said in the previous video. Some transformers are inherently current limited and short circuit proof because of their construction. Those usually have magnetic shunts. This is an example of a transformer constructed with a magnetic shunt, which is this part. It has the primary, the secondary and this magnetic shunt, which limits the current when it's shorted out. You can basically short it out or overload it without exceeding the maximum current of it. And also when you load it, the voltage on the secondary easily drops. The voltage on the secondary drops steeply with the loading current. Let's see what's happening inside of the transformer. The magnetic flux goes from the primary. And when it's not loaded, it goes the easier path. So it goes through the secondary like this. Because the core in the secondary has no air gap. And it's easier for the magnetic field to travel through iron than it is to travel through air. So it chooses this path. But when you short it out, the current in the secondary coil basically works against the magnetic flux from the primary. And so the magnetic flux doesn't want to go through this coil and it chooses a different path. It goes through the magnetic shunt here. When it's overloaded or shorted out, the magnetic flux basically goes like this. It avoids the secondary. And the size of this air gap basically sets the current limit. If there was no air gap, the magnetic flux would basically go through the shunt even when it's not loaded and so the secondary voltage would drop even with no load and it would be able to supply just a very very little current. On the other hand, a normal transformer with no magnetic shunt will have a very high short circuit current. When you short it out, it will probably trip the breaker or blow a fuse or overheat. And this is because the magnetic flux, and of course I mean AC magnetic flux from the primary, has no other way to go than the secondary. But when it's shorted out, it will result in a very high overcurrent. In a normal transformer, the short circuit current is more or less limited by just the resistance of the windings. Which means that it's limited resistively, so it dissipates quite a lot of power and it may overheat. Of course, it may also try to force the magnetic flux through here, but it has to travel a very long distance through air. And of course, forcing the magnetic flux to go a long distance through air requires quite a high current in the primary. So it may overheat. And of course, there are various shapes of transformer cores. A lot of them look like this. This is a normal transformer, but 
If it has magnetic shunts, it may, for example, look like this. Let's say this is the primary end. The magnetic flux through it can avoid the secondary like this. So this is how it avoids the secondary when it's shorted out and this is how it works normally. So if you have this kind of transformer, you already have the current limited. But if your transformer is not current limited, you have to limit the current externally using for example an inductor, either on the primary side or on the secondary side. But of course it's probably easier to find an inductor which you can use for the primary side because it uses a lower voltage. It's probably not easy to find or make a high voltage inductor. And for a Tesla coil people very often use a neon sign transformer or NST. It usually supplies about 4 to 15 kilovolts and usually tens of milliamps. It usually has this kind of core with magnetic shunts, so it's current limited and the secondary is usually grounded at its center top. It basically has two halves. For example, a 4 kV one will have two outputs with two kV on it in reference to ground, but with an opposite phase, so in between of them there is 4 kV. But of course neon sign transformers are slowly disappearing because neons are being replaced with LEDs and even the newer neons usually have an electronic transformer which is basically a switching power supply. They usually no longer have this classic iron transformer anyway. And the electronic one is not suitable for a Tesla coil. And in my country neon signs were never really common. And of course for a bigger Tesla coil a neon sign transformer, especially a smaller one, may not supply enough current. But on the other hand you can put them in parallel for more current and power. But you can't put them in a series because the center tap is already grounded. But of course the voltage is usually already enough so you don't have to put them in a series. You want to put them in parallel for more current. And there are also some other types of high voltage transformers, for example oil burner ignition transformers. I have seen them on the internet but never in real life. And of course for a bigger Tesla coil you can use a smaller distribution transformer. But of course this is way too much for my size of Tesla coil. And there are also some high voltage measuring transformers which are used to measure the voltage of high voltage power lines. And a measuring transformer sound is misleading, but it can still be something like one or a few kilovolt amps. So let's use by far the most common high voltage transformer nowadays. Instead of relying on some rare or vintage or expensive transformers, let's use something very common and something that probably everybody can get for free. Those are microwave oven transformers and obviously they come from microwave ovens. A microwave oven transformer is basically a standard iron transformer which runs at main frequency and it's used to power the magnetron in a microwave oven. The primary of it is basically main voltage and it has two secondaries. One of them is for the heater of the magnetron which is usually 3.15 or 3.3 or 3.5 volts, but this is useless for us. And the other winding is usually 2100 volts and it can supply about half an amp. And its output voltage seems a bit too low. Well, it doesn't seem low for an unlucky person who touches it. It's absolutely deadly, but it seems a little bit too low for a Tesla coil. But of course you can put more in series for more voltage. But because one end of the secondary is grounded, it's a bit tricky to put more than two in series. And they are not very well current limited. You have to use something external for current limitation. Here you can see some examples of a microwave oven transformer. And it has the primary for the mains voltage here. It has some heater winding, which is not interesting now. And it has the secondary here, roughly 2100 volts. One end of it is on this terminal here. And the other end of it is connected with the core and the core is basically then grounded using the metal cabinet. So this is basically the other end of the secondary. It's roughly the same in most of them. 
Here is the hot terminal of the secondary and the other one is grounded here. And here is the hot terminal of secondary and the other one again goes to the core here. And those transformers are not really current limited. When I try to short it out, the secondary current is about 2 amps and the primary current is about 20 amps in a short circuit, which is too much and it would very soon overheat. And microwave oven transformers actually have some magnetic shunts in them, but they are not sufficient. Here you can see the magnetic shunt in it. And in this one here. And of course on the other side as well. And the same in this one here and here. There are magnetic shunts in it, but the problem is that their cross section is much smaller than the cross section of the core. They can't really take the full magnetic flux from the primary. It goes like this. And some portion of it can go like this, but not all. It doesn't really limit the current enough. The short circuit current of it is too high and it has to be limited externally. But of course you can use some kind of inductor to limit the current on the primary side. You can for example use some fluorescent lamp inductors or discharge lamp inductors. Very good ones are for example inductors for discharge lamp street lights. For example mercury vapor or sodium vapor or metal halide discharge lamps. And in the worst case you can use primary of another microwave oven transformer as an inductor and short out the secondary and it basically also works as an inductor. I am for example using inductors from sodium vapor street lights which are modified. The inductance was too high which means that they were passing too little current. They were limiting the current basically too much. So I removed this section of the core and I only kept this part of the core. This basically makes the air gap in the core much bigger. It reduces the inductance and thus it increases the current, it passes. It's basically a winding and the core is just in the center of it. I can put one in series with the primary of my high voltage transformer or for more current I can use more parallel ones like this. Now let's try to put more microwave oven transformers in series for more voltage. And of course I mean the secondaries in series. Because one end of the secondary is grounded or actually connected with the core, it's a bit tricky to connect more than two of them in series. If you put just two in series it's quite simple. You basically turn it into a center tapped transformer. You have those two secondaries in series and the center of it is grounded so each side of it has 2100 volts and the total voltage is 4200 volts. But of course for those voltages to add instead of subtract they have to be in the opposite phase. If they are in the same phase they are subtracting and you actually get almost no voltage. So it's important to have the windings in the right direction according to those dots. If it produces virtually no voltage it probably means that the directions are wrong. But one end of the secondary is grounded so it's not possible to swap the ends of the secondary and you have to swap the ends of the primary. So if it doesn't work well you have to cross the ends of one primary basically. If they are in phase you basically have to do this. And it's also possible to put the mains in series with the secondaries to get a little bit of extra voltage like this. Instead of grounding the secondaries. This is what I usually do. But of course the disadvantage is that now one core is live and one is neutral. You basically have 230 volts between the cores. And you can't for example put them on a common metal surface. And you also shouldn't touch them but of course you shouldn't get anywhere near this power supply when it's running anyway. But of course you can also disconnect the lower ends of the secondaries and connect them with mains, but keep the cores grounded. But of course there is still the inductor. But if you want to put more than two microwave oven transformers in series, 
you have to disconnect the lower end of the secondary in those two ones, of course. This is my power supply with four microwave oven transformers. All the secondaries are in series and the main voltage is added to it. So I theoretically get 8630 volts. But of course there has to be an inductor and the voltage drops on the inductor a little bit even when it's not loaded. Because the transformers draw some current even when they are not loaded. And of course this may or may not work because the voltage on the isolation of the transformer is now higher. Normally the transformer has zero volts on the lower end of the secondary and 2100 volts on the upper end of it. This is still the case for this one but this one has now 2100 volts on the lower end and 4200 volts on the upper end of it. So this voltage basically doubles and this one is the secondary voltage of the one under it basically instead of zero. And of course those transformers differ. In some of them the isolation may be good enough for this and in some of them probably not. And on top of it, in some of them it's almost impossible to disconnect the lower end of the secondary from the core. For example here you can see that this wire is basically squeezed between the secondary and the core. You can't really disconnect it. This is always going to be connected with the core. In this one it's not squeezed here, but it exits the winding very close to the core and you can't even slide any kind of isolation under it because it's right at the edge here. There is still quite some risk that it may arc over from this wire to the core. In this one it's better because it goes from the winding in the middle. So you can disconnect it and slide some insulation under it so it's more isolated from the core. I basically did this in this one. I disconnected the lower end of the secondary from the core here from this rivet and I connected a wire to it. And then I basically slided some plastic pieces as an insulation under it, like this. So it's now insulated well. And for any case, I put also some insulation under the secondary on the other side of it. And this is my entire power supply with four microwave oven transformers, with secondaries in a series. And the transformer I was showing now is this one. And those two don't have a higher voltage on them. Here the secondary is still connected normally. Here as well. And the one on the other end of it is a special kind of microwave oven transformer. An unusual one. This one is quite a nice one. It's made by Moulinex France. And there is some schematic or diagram on it. It says 2100 volts on the secondary. And... It's one of the best microwave oven transformers you can get. It has a plastic bobbin. The windings are basically on this massive plastic insulation instead of on a just piece of paper. This one is definitely the best one if you want to disconnect the lower end of the secondary and connect it in a series with another secondary. And the secondary is actually not connected here with the core. It has two individual terminals. But I still slided some pieces of insulation around the winding, just for case. But of course one end of the secondary was still meant to be connected with the core. It's this one, and it's getting close to the core here. But I put some kind of isolation under it to isolate it from the core. Here it's close to the core, but I slided some plastic layer under it and some sticky tape over it so it stays in place. And of course all the windings have to be in the right direction, so the voltages are adding and not subtracting. And to check it, it's possible to use a very low AC voltage at the input. Just a couple volts AC, for example a 6 volt transformer connected to the input and then you can measure the output using a multimeter. You can measure if the main voltage is adding to the voltage of this one or subtracting and if the voltage of this one is adding to the voltage of this one and so on. Of course you could also leave the secondary connected to the core and connect the high voltage to the core of it, but this is probably not a good idea because 
The high voltage isolation would rely just on the isolation of the primary, which is not so good. It's meant for just the mains voltage. So this is my high voltage power supply for my Tesla coil. Of course the Tesla coil is not going to use the full power of those four transformers. Each of them is about one kilovolt amp. But I use more of them just for higher voltage. The current will be limited by those inductors. But of course it's possible to make a nice Tesla coil with just three or even two. So this is Diagno Wild and see you in my next videos and thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And in the third episode I plan to build this capacitor.